Welcome to No Occasion to Shout. Um, today we're going to be talking about a wrinkle in time, specifically the the moment in the episode where Rick is uncertain about time and they're messing with uh, the philosophical concepts of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, and who better to talk about that with, than with someone who has a degree in both physics and the philosophy of science. Yeah. So uh, Robin just watched uh, th this clip that I will have linked on YouTube and let's hear his thoughts. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it open. So, so let me ask you a question since you know about right. this show, Rick and Morty, before we start, which is, do you know what the, the physics educational background is of the creators of this show? I do not, but I am um, assuming that their knowledge of these things is more philosophical than it is mathematical because there are some episodes where they really just make uh, errors in um, mathematical errors okay. um, that don't make much sense. It's not like Futurama, where in Futurama, I think definitely there were some people with a degree in physics working on the show. All right, because... Um, They're just educated on the philosophy. Well, yeah, or, or maybe not even the philosophy, maybe just kind of the, the if you like, the qualitative concepts in quantum mechanics in this case, right? So, um, yeah, and there was a lot in there. I mean, I thought um, this was definitely done by some, not by somebody that just read a book on quantum mechanics once. I mean, there's, there is some knowledge there. Um, and, uh, and I found it, uh, I found it entertaining. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. So where to begin? Oh my goodness. Let's start with uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Let's explain that in. Okay the best way that you can. Yeah, now, so this is interesting because I'm aware that I'm doing this for uh, a broad audience, right? So I may, I'll just start explain, explaining. And if I think that my explanation is going off uh, into something too complex, then I might just back up. So bear with me. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is one of the most exciting, um, I was going to say concepts in quantum mechanics, but in a way that's to undersell it. It's, probably one of the most exciting truths about our physical universe, right? Um, you know, when I first came across it, it was really one of those, uh, well, and, and I was reading kind of popular science, like Brief History of Time and that, from about the age of kind of 14, 15. So I was coming across these concepts initially long before I actually went, you know, to Cambridge to study. Them. Um, so what the... What Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says is that there are certain pairs of physical properties or quantities, um, and there are different that, that that don't exist certainly or at certain values for, um, if you like, a closed system. So, for example. Um, Momentum and position are two very important ones. So a, a subatomic particle does not have simultaneously an exact momentum and an exact location. Now, some people mistakenly think that this is a statement about the limits of measurement. It is not. It is a statement about fundamental reality it's it's almost ontology right we're talking about the fundamental nature of stuff of things so in other words the fundamental um qualities of a physical object are not uh, do not have exact values they are probability distributions and what this uh, heisenberg's uncertainty principle says is for these special pairs of properties or qualities of a thing if you multiply the uncertainty in one by the uncertainty in the other, you get a number that always exceeds a certain value. Planck's constant. So one of the corollaries of this principle is, since the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum of a thing has to exceed some value greater than zero, if you know exactly where a thing is, right? 
you know, if a thing has a position, a certain position, mm -hmm. then it does not actually have a known momentum. You know nothing about the momentum. But in fact, the laws of physics themselves know nothing about the momentum. It has a uniformly randomly distributed momentum, this thing whose location you know certainly. And similarly, if you know the, the momentum of something with certainty, i.e. how fast it's going and in which direction, you know nothing about where it is. But not only do you know nothing about where it is, it actually is not in a particular place. Right? A position is not a, a, an actual, yeah, in the normal sense, a, a quantity that that entity has. So how is it that we find things when we look at them? Well, when you look at them and the clip goes to this, which is kind of one of the most interesting bits, you end up doing something, when you actually do an experiment to observe something, based on what you choose to observe, you cause the entity to have that quality within some range of certainty. So if I've got a particle, and I will finish this, this is the end, I'm coming to the end of this paragraph. Um, if you have something where you know its momentum but not its position, and then you set up an experiment to pin down its position, by doing that, you give it a position and you create an uncertainty in its momentum. And that process is uh, related to this thing called collapsing the wave function. And this is why um in a way this is why i'm gonna say <laughs> this is a generalization but um th this is a, a f one of the fundamental bases for the idea that consciousness is actually fundamental uh in physics now this is obviously disputed philosophically right mm -hmm. but but um to to it seems that to collapse a wave function and therefore to give entities certain properties uh you need some conscious mind actually doing the observation okay so in my head i have an explanation for this and you can explain why it is it is wrong or um or whether I've, i'm onto something or if it's already a theory okay so the way that einstein had his thought experiment um when describing space time um so the ball bouncing and then you take a a picture of each second um, and then you layer it together and then you create like a space time that was uh, he wrote that in I think special relativity. Um, is it possible that the the consciousness in our in our minds that the amount of information that we are able to um, store, for example, at in terms of duration of time, so our milliseconds is it possible that these particles are behaving in a way that are, uh, it's a duration of time that's so short that our minds aren't able to process it because we can't process. No, okay, so you're talking about something interesting, but I think it's unrelated. Okay. Um, and it goes to this point that quantum mechanics, which is really the theory we're, talk we're talking about, although you've moved to relativity, so. Okay. I'm putting that on the side. Quantum mechanics is the best theory that human beings have ever come up with, physical theory, scientific theory, with respect to its power to predict and the precisions of the predictions that it makes. And um, the, the theory requires that the fundamental properties of things are basically probability distributions they're waves of probability that collapse to certainty when we look at them now you actually despite the last part of that sentence that claps to if you like give you certainties when you you know look at them when you do observations the theory operates um with this utmost precision without any need to reference consciousness right so if if i once I know the quantum mechanical state of a system, um, we can predict with this unbelievable precision how it will evolve. Now, the evolution of that um, system is actually an evolution of probabilities or probability waves, probabilities you could say about properties. But that evolution does not involve the mind at all. And, it, and the evolution um, of 
the states of a system works with continuous time. So in the equations, you've got T and it is continuous time. Um, and uh, the math works out so well that we can build all of the modern world based on this theory. So, uh, so we're not looking at, you know, if you like, uh, discretations of time in consciousness. That the, the theory doesn't depend on anything like that. Okay. What about um, when is it? Is there any theories that revolve around the speed of light influencing time in a way that we're looking at particles um, backwards in time or forwards in time? Okay. So, so just by the words you're using there, you're kind of touching on so much of physics, very mm -hmm. different areas. So let me, um, so the first thing to say, and, and if I'm missing your point, you, you correct me or stop me. Mm -hmm. The first thing to say is when you're dealing with time and the speed of light, um, and the predictions we make based on our understanding of those things, you're dealing in relativity. You're dealing in special relativity and general relativity. You're dealing in um, what Einstein is famous for, right? Um, yeah. Although actually Einstein was very important in the foundation of quantum mechanics. Now, um, quantum mechanics and relativity are mutually inconsistent theories. I, I understand that. In my head, I always try to put them together somehow. You and the rest of the scientific community. <laughs> um, so this is the forefront of physics. In a way, this is a kind of holy grail. Um, this is one way of thinking of the, uh, the attempt to get to a grand unified theory. We know that the grand unified theory, um, or if you like, the next big uh, step in physics. Uh, um, no, that, I can't say the next big step in physics, so you never know what that will be. But that we know we want to have with massive philosophical uh, consequence is um, to eliminate the contradiction uh, between um, relativity and uh, quantum mechanics. Now, obviously, quantum mechanics um, is, is a theory about the very small, right? Things mm -hmm. on the atomic scale. Um, and as I say, it's highly precise. General relativity is about the very big and the very fast um, yes. and is extremely accurate and us, allows us to make extraordinary predictions on the cosmological scale. scale. Um, and as I say, these are both very well experimentally tested theories. Mm -hmm. Now, um, but so, so the interesting point is obviously, okay, what if we're talking about things that are very small subatomic um, and we try and understand, uh, re you know, relativistic um, uh, properties uh, of these very small things. I, you know, when you've got very small things going at close to the speed of light and you've got time effects going on, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, so that, that's just a, that's a big question mark right there, which I think your question was. Here's, like, here's another way to phrase this. Okay. Um, in your opinion, if you had to, if you had to point to one, um, let's say property or um, such as gravity, time, vibration, frequency, if you had to point to one thing that you think might be promising in regards to reconciling relativity and quantum mechanics, what element would that be? Do you think it's time or do you think it's gravity or do you think there's any research in? Well, well gra gravity is something that you, that you need special, that you need a general relativity to understand, right? Now, the thing is, if you're talking about. Or acceleration. Is, would that be a better term to say? Well, it's a, 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 again, you see your theory, your general relativity gives you a way of understanding acceleration, right? So there's a sense in, you know, obviously acceleration is rate of change of, uh, you know, of speed, uh, is, is change in rate of change of speed. Um, yeah, you know, that's, there's a sense in which, I mean, that's not, that, that's kind of a non-fundamental idea. Right. I mean, obviously, there you're dealing in distance, you're dealing in time, you're dealing with time um, uh, kind of twice, right? Distance per unit, time per unit, time. Um, so the, the, the notion of time is obviously a lot more, let's say, primitive or fundamental than, than acceleration. So, um, I mean, you, you, an earlier question, because as I said, you mentioned a lot of things, an earlier question that you asked raised what I think is an interesting avenue um or idea which is that 
part of the, uh, something related to the uncertainty principle is that what we in our common sense think is continuous can't be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so most famously, uh, obviously the whole, yeah, a quantum is, yeah, it refers to a, um, a quantum of light and that we know that, um, which being a photon. And um, so, you know, an atom will emit uh, photons at discreetly spaced frequencies, not over continuous frequencies. And that was this discovery that was at the root of quantum mechanics, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. It was it was on is it was just understanding that coming up with a theoretical explanation for, for that observation um, was was one of the most was was one of the drivers of of uh, the construction of quantum mechanics as a concept. Now, what was the constant for Newton? Was it, what was the constant for Newton? Was it time? Was time constant for Newton? Well, in, in Newton is, is if you, Isaac Newton, his uh, physics is if you like our common sense world, right? So um, in Newton, in Isaac Newton's physics, um, which is I think kind of in a way what most people think of when they think of, I don't know, physics. Um, I think it's it, when it, 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 they think, let, let, me, let me answer with Newton. Newton, Newton's common sense world in which his laws operate have they operate on a background of time and space that is immutable right okay. so so as we, yeah, we walk down the street every meter that we pass is the same meter there's nothing you can do in you know you can't whether you're running fast or throwing a ball in the air or spitting on the on the ground it doesn't change what a yard is right it doesn't change the units of measurement um, same, it doesn't change how long a second takes to pass. That, so they are background I concepts that Newton's theories use. Einstein's fundamental change is that those concepts themselves become subject to the laws, right? So yeah. when, you, when you run, you change time for you, right? As you speed up, time becomes different from the guy who's not moving the lightning bolt with on the train track that concept what do you mean by that um that was one of einstein's thought experience thought experiments where two lightning bolts um flash at the same time the person on the ground would perceive it perceive the the sound and the lightning at the same time but someone that was in a train going at the speed of light Okay. Okay. Right. So yeah. So so no no. So so that was yeah. That was a thought experiment that that he was doing. So now you're getting kind of if you like to the conceptual basis of relativity. So we're jumping around a lot here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the the fundamental thought experiment behind relativity is what would the world look like if I was traveling on a beam of light? If I was moving at the speed of light, um, mm -hmm. and the, where he got to by by this extraordinary kind of train of thought was that the thing that has to be constant, if you like, the fundamental uh, constant in the universe can't be. Um, it, well, he he came up with the speed of light. So so the speed of light. Well, that's how fast light moves per unit. How far light moves per unit time in relativity. The idea of how far something's going is malleable. Time is malleable, right? So if you've got two malleable things divided by each other, you can keep a, co a constant. And, and it's a very counterintuitive thing, right? That the thing that never changes is the speed of light. But time itself ticks by changes. It ticks by at different rates in different parts of the universe and differently strong gravitational fields for people going accelerating at different rates, right? Um, so, so, and there were a lot of thought experiments that he did, which I think is what you're talking about here, um, where in, in trying to explain relativity, and we also need to separate out special relativity, which did not incorporate gravity, and general relativity, which, is, which incorporates gravity and where you've got space and time curving around large masses. That was general relativity. It's a lot more complex than special relativity. Mathematically, it's much more difficult. Um, but in special relativity, uh, you, you, you do, um, you actually have, you know, physics problems that involve exactly the kind of uh, 
thought experiment that you indicated, right? So, you know, you've got a guy on a train moving at a certain speed um, and uh, time is changing uh, for him and distances are dilating for him. Um, and uh, so, you know, and so you can compare how things are perceived by observers in different reference frames. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would what that's what your example is an example of. All right. Okay. So let's go back to one thing I thought was interesting that is more philosophy than physics. Um, Rick's assumption when he was missing the button by a half a second. His first assumption was that the other Rick was trying to kill him. So, <laughs> so that like they're playing with so many concepts here. So, so the one of the fundamental concepts that um, you need to to really appreciate that clip is the many universes theory, right? So um, now this goes go back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's intimately related. So based on um, so I was talking about uncertainty, mm -hmm. and what, and I said that things only become certain, and there's an explicit nod to this idea in the clip, right? Um, things, he, Rick, uh, the, 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 is it Rick, the doctor, the, the mad scientist guy, yeah, yep. um, said, uh, you can only be uncertain for so long, eventually things become certain, or something, he said something like that, you have, there has to certainty in the end. Now, th that, he's referring to the collapsing of the wave function, the observation, right? When you actually do the experiment or make the observation to work out which reality you're in. I'm putting that in quotes, right? So you've got physics, the, the laws of physics are operating on these distributions of probability. But then when you look, it's like the dice are rolled and you get a result according to the distribution of probability that actually, okay, this particle is in this place going at this speed, right? Now, um, so now you have your certainty. Now, one of the philosophical interpretations of this crazy theory, which is that the own that things are if the probabilistic properties of things are evolving according to the laws of physics, and only when you look do you find out do you find out what reality you're in, or do you force reality to choose? Right mm -hmm. now, the two ways I said it are the different philosophical interpretations. Um, the finding out what reality you're in is the one they're playing with in that show, the many universes theory, which is that until you do the experiment to see which reality you're in, the universe is evolving in a myriad ways based on the probability distributions of the properties, right? So if there's two ways that, um, a system could evolve, let's say, with a 50% probability each way, um, which is a simplification, but this is the simplification that relates to Schrodinger's cats, by the way, which is also mentioned in the, in the clip. Then, then there are, in fact, two parallel universes that exist. And then you do the experiment at some point in the future, and you discover that you're in, you know, universe A. You, that's the reality that you're in. But there's this other reality that you discover you're not in that, that, all were, that was existing all the time. So you have this concept of multiple universes. Um, and uh, that's different from the interpretation that is, there's no multiple universes, there's one. The fundamental things are, not, are property waves. And when you look, somehow consciousness forces the universe to choose, you know, to crystallize out, to crystallize out from the uncertainty, a certainty. Um, yeah. And this was what Einstein objected to, by the way. And he said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Hmm. So he would have, so he would have um, thought that there was his, he would think it was more likely there are multiple universes. So I knew you were going to ask that. And the answer <laughs> I would say is no. Um, because what Einstein, Einstein simply wouldn't accept um, that the fundamental laws of the universe operate on uncertainties, on probabilities. That, that chance could be in, at, the, at the root of our understanding, that you can't go beyond it. What he and a lot of scientists at the time 
uh, worked on was the hidden variable theory, um, which is the idea that it only appears to be that way because there's some variable that's governing reality that we can't see, that mm. we can't analyze, that we can't get to. Um, now, since then, um, which is, and by the way, it's kind of fascinating from a history of science point of view, because Einstein, although popularly he's not identified with quantum mechanics as much, he was a founder of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. but he just rejected the philosophical implications of what he was helping to develop with that quote, God does, doesn't play dice. So he and, and other great scientists, um, I'm thinking of, of Bohr, uh, is that right? Um, were, were really did a lot of work on working out whether the results of the experiments that we had could be in principle consistent with the existence of a hidden variable, right? That, um, that it really is just our ignorance and not a fundamental thing about the nature of the universe. And, um, and I, I, back in the day when I was at Cambridge, this was something I was very interested in. And I don't know how things have evolved in, you know, in the field since then. But my understanding was very clearly when I left Cambridge that um, amazing work had been done on this and it had been experimentally ruled out. Um, that, you know, whatever else, whatever may be incomplete about our understanding uh, of the universe, you know, of, of quantum mechanics, uh, of, sub, of what subatomic particles do, what cannot be true, I believe has been determined, is that the theory that we have is, is correct and there is a hidden variable which we just don't know yet. Um, and, uh, and some of the experimental tests of this are, are, are just ingenious. Um, mm. But all the experiments point to, you know, unfortunately Einstein's philosophical instinct being wrong. Um, so Nikola Tesla, said something before he shortly before he died or wrote or it might have been written um he said that if scientists wish to discover the mysteries of the universe they should look to three different things i think they were vibration frequency and um okay do you, are you familiar with that quote um i i I don't know. I don't know the exact quote, but I'm I'm nodding because it goes back to something you were asking about. Where do I think they should look? And now I'm I'm getting to where that came from. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So this is really this is good stuff. Um, fr frequency. So one of the courses that you do at Cambridge, if you're studying physics, is called uh, systems, and um, basically it's a course about waves, vibrations, and frequency. Because these are concepts that seem to appear in every area of physics, right? So you could be doing, so all of this probability stuff, um, these probability waves, right, in quantum mechanics, um, you need, that they're waves. So you're actually doing the maths of vibrations and frequencies, right? And mm -hmm. And the actual answers you get to physical problems uh, come out of certain frequency values that certain things in certain systems have, for example, right? Um, so, uh, so that quantum mechanics, oh, you know, electromagnetism, obviously, right? Um, circuits, um, yeah, current, things like that. Um, gravity, gravity waves, there are gravity waves. Uh, like, it doesn't matter where you look, fluid dynamics, it doesn't matter where you look in the universe, um, you, you often come back to uh, frequencies and waves um, as a way of understanding pretty much any system, any, any kind of system. Um, systems that, to our common sense, may appear at first glance to be quite unrelated. So, um, yes, it seems like frequency is a is of ubiquitous import to our existence waves um and you can have waves of many things right i mean you can think of waves on the on on the surface of the, of the sea um but the mathematics that that you're dealing with are, are the same um in many respects 
as the mathematics that you're dealing with when you're dealing with uh, you know the momentum of uh, subatomic particles, right? Um, so these are phenomena that exist across all domains on all scales, and they are perhaps the most ubiquitous physical phenomena. Yeah, yeah, which is why you have, if you like, a meta course in physics at Cambridge called Systems. Systems, right? Well, what's a system? But it's anything. Um, you know, separate from your quantum mechanics course, from your, you know, dynamics course, whatever it may be, relativity. So, yeah, yeah. Finish that quote. Frequency, vibration, and what? Our viewers are going to have to look it up and comment. Okay, cool. Because obviously, frequency, vibration, waves, oscillation, they're all, they're all related. It has something, I would, if I had to guess, I would say magnetism. Oh, okay. Well, that would be weird because, well, Tesla has the skin in the game with magnetism, right? I mean, he was, uh, yeah, we measure uh, uh, yeah, magnetic fields in, 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 um, uh, in Teslas. But it doesn't uh, fit the quote. Right, but it, it, it doesn't sit with what I have just said. But yeah. of course, at that time when Tesla was working in electromagnetism, um, he was discovering uh, through magnetism somewhere else in our universe where waves and oscillations and frequency was of fundamental importance. A place where, you know, at first glance at many things that may involve electricity, you wouldn't expect to see it there. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that, it would make sense that at that time, because of how he would have come across the import of vibration, frequency waves through magnetism, that he would have said that. So that, that in historical context, I can, yeah, okay. I, I won't blame him. So yeah. there was a, a part when we were uh, both watching, um, this clip that you started, and I think we started at different times that you started laughing. Do you remember what part? Oh, that I was? did. Yeah. What was that? Um, I can't, but I wish I could because I remember it being quite, uh, quite clever. Um, oh. I thought the the part where the um, the fourth dimensional goo being um, went and beat up Einstein, I thought that was pretty funny. I laughed before that, but yes. Um, no, I laughed before that. It was something that Rick said. Uh, I, one thing that one general conceit throughout the whole clip that's worth okay. mentioning um, is that quantum mechanics is a theory, if you like, of uncertainty in the physical world, right? Mm -hmm. that, that physical things don't have certain properties, they have uncertain ones. What that clip did, with, did was it played with uncertainty um, epistemological uncertainty yeah. in the same way as quantum mechanics kind of deals with, or in parallel to how quantum mechanics deals with actual physical uncertainty, right? It's uncertainty in the physical values, in physical theory, mm -hmm. in the nature of the world. Um, and so kind of what was, was going on was, you know, the universe was splitting, you're getting these many universes when the characters, when Rick was uncertain about something, Right, which is, is very playful, right? Because it's, it's saying that the, the origin of the splitting of the universe doesn't have to be a physical uncertainty in the theory, but just like he doesn't know what he wants. Um, yeah. Now, or, or to, to take that even further, that um, uh, our consciousness or our thoughts um, shape or influence reality. Well, right, right. And so this, so, so, which is why the whole thing is kind of very kind of intertwined and, and, and playful because um, some scientists have gone so far as saying that um, consciousness is fundamental. Like the quantum mechanic shows us that consciousness is irreducible. In other words, you know, Sam Harris is wrong, right? Let's, let's kind of go the whole way metaphysically. Right, and that you need a consciousness to make the universe real, and I think Wheeler was a, a proponent of this idea, or he certainly elaborated it. A famous physicist called Wheeler, um, and some have gone so far as to say this is why there must be a god, 
because you've got to have the consciousness to collapse the wave functions so that the universe becomes real rather than just a set of probabilities. What are the, what are the, so I'm sure you've read Thomas Aquinas. God, no, I, you know, I haven't said I, so much of the, of the, of the important thinkers. And, <laughs> and this is true for economists as well as some of the, you know, the great philosophers and theologians. Um, you know, I find that, I come up against bits of them because of other reading I'm doing that obviously draws on them. Yeah. And, and I just, I think also because I'm an ENTP and I'm not good at concentrating on one thing for a long time. I find it hard to like, okay, yeah. I'm going to sit down and do this for three months, Aquinas or, you know, Adam Smith or, um, yeah, because a lot of these, a lot of these guys, that's what it takes to do it right. And I would want to do it properly. And what that often means is I don't ever get around to doing it properly. So I dip in and dip out. So no, I would not say I have read Aquinas. You're familiar with Aquinas. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the, his, yeah. uh, the epistemological assumptions under Aquinas's philosophy were such that God would have to be um, perfect. And that's the word he used, perfect. Which would have made sense during the time period of the philosophy. Do you think that the physics, that quantum mechanics changes this idea that a God could exist, but not necessarily be a perfect being? No, because I think you're dealing, I don't, I don't think there's, um, I don't even think there's an intuitive connection between um, uncertainty in quantum mechanics and morality. I think obviously there's serious connections between um, the serious implications for consciousness and the nature of it in its place in the universe. Um, but I think you're asking different questions. And I, cause I, the reason I say that is because the word perfect, I mean, it's at least talking about morality in some sense, right? It refers to that. Um, you're talking about you know, a, a complex Let's meaning. Let's use a different word from perfect. Let's use omnipotence. Is okay. omnipotence okay. necessary? Um, uh, no, again, I, I, it's too much of a leap for me. Um, I mean, I, I mean, for what it's worth, I started, as I said, getting passionate about these kind of ideas in physics at the age of about 14, 15. And I took it to quite a high level. And I ended up coming out of my studies of physics um, as a non-philosophical materialist. I mean, I mean, so you could say deist, I, I kind of hate the term because it has other connotations, but, but, but my understanding of the universe is more, let's say deistic than it would be Sam Harris's materialistic. And, um, but, and I think, and I think part of that is an intuition, but I think that intuition is strongly formed by my understanding of, of um, physics and certainly of quantum mechanics and the place of consciousness. So I, I don't buy, I don't buy the, um, the many universes theory of quantum or interpretation of quantum mechanics that some materialists find more philosophically acceptable, right? Okay. Um, because you're, it takes consciousness on, out of the equation. Peterson. Say again? So you're on Jordan Peterson's level in a sense. Uh, um, when it, metaphysically, I'm definitely closer to Peterson. Me, epistemologically, I'm closer to Sam Harris, but I think Sam Harris makes this, I mean, I, it, it's maybe not fair for me to say it because I haven't sat down and had a conversation with Sam Harris. I'd love to do that. Um, I think the likes of Sam Harris may, are making a leap of faith. Um, and, and, and I know that that's not a new idea, but, but I, I can't make that leap with Harris. Um, mm. Is it that the world is only material? Yes, yes. I think that's the bigger leap. Um, although I agree with Harris against Peterson on notions of truth. I think what, what, I think Peterson muddles truth with effective heuristic. But that's another show. <laughs> that is another show. Um, the, which also almost brings us back to um, Rick's from a psychological perspective. We could look at that same, that same situation with Rick, because there was psychology in this too, because he does say, please, God, help me. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then, never mind God, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. 
God, that and, was, yeah, yeah. And we can point back to the morality in the very beginning where his cause of, um, his causes of uncertainty, because you could make the theoretical argument that he was like, okay, something messed up in time. I'm not touching the button at the same time. Let me hold the button down or start pushing the button faster or wait five seconds and press the button again to try to fix it. He could have, there's multiple different ways that he could have handled that. But his initial assumption is that the other Rick is trying to kill him. That's how he feels about himself. That's an inner- Oh, right, okay, okay, so sure. Oh, now you've gone, yeah, you've taken that completely off. Yeah, right, okay. Because there oh, is I... psychology in here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there is. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean that bit, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example that you brought out of the clip. I mean, the, the idea, yeah, the psychology behind a guy making a deal with God and then saying, yeah, he basically wins the deal and then says, you know, F you. I was kidding all along almost, right? That, that yeah, and, uh, and it, can that be a sincere shift? Um, but you see that you, you could go down a psychological route with that. Um, but you could also say that that's kind of a nice, um, it's kind of a nice nod to the fact that, um, you know, some people say that, yeah, some people obviously believe you. God invents physics. Some people say that the, out, the, the outgrowths of the physical world, us, invent God. Um, and if we didn't, we, if there wasn't one, we'd have to invent them anyway, right? And then, um, so, so, so if God is, is an idea that comes for us, can, can, you, can, can we make God real for, su for such time as we need him and then legitimately throw him out? I mean, it's just, it's, it's funny. It's, it, it's something, yeah. that, I mean, it's playing with a philosophical idea as well as the psychology of this strange this strange man and and yeah i mean this is why it's that's a great i mean what a great show. i've really got to start watching the show because it's actually so dense and layered right um and it, it I, I imagine i don't know if the whole show is like this but the clips that you've shown me they bear watching multiple times because there's there's things you can pick out a few you know, of the these clips i choose are pretty um are pretty specific the, the entire show isn't that clever um, okay, okay. The concepts are, um, there are, I could, I could pull out some, um, some scenes too, which might be interesting, that kind of show their, their lack of ignorance, or their, their ignorance in, in the, the physics. Okay. And that could be an interesting conversation on where they got wrong and why. Um, but for our viewers, if you have any specific clips you want, me and Robin to talk about and to Robin to review the quantum mechanics of link it in the comments um, or any of the episodes or any of the scene that was a, a rickle in time and we did an hour on that wow that went fast so that means I was having fun so another good call Austin um, so and then we will be uh, trying to get these episodes out Thursdays all right does that work we're doing Thursday. Yeah, we're doing Thursday. So when I don't know when we decided we were going to put these All right, out. So no occasion to shout at gmail.com. You can email us uh, there. And also like and comment and subscribe. Yes, definitely subscribe. Hey, thanks, Austin. This has been a good one. All right, thanks, Rob.